There it is. Let's say maybe. Uh... <laughs> Is it coming through? Oh wow, it's just super, super, super delayed right now. All right, mm. that's all right. <laughs> and... What's up, everybody? Thank you for tapping into some Untapped Keg, our podcast about sobriety and mental health, where we spotlight stories that provide hope and love. You can find us on all podcast platforms. Hit that subscribe button. Look up Untapped Keg. Find us on YouTube, youtube.com slash Untapped Keg. You look, watch some of our shorts, watch all our past episodes. Uh, we got some we got some good ones there. And then, you know what? <clears throat> Check out the initiative that big cab from laugh our purpose and i have started uh we started a men's group where we get in uh about once a month it's called untapped brotherhood for a purpose and we just talk about our emotions our feelings some of our struggles celebrate some triumphs um you know it's not one of those men's groups where you get in and you just bash women or everything else like we we really talk through our problems and um, we talk about how things affect us and try to show that being emotional and being in touch with your um, emotions, it goes a long way and there's a lot of strength there. And that's something that I think all of us are learning right now because it's not something that we were taught. So it's something that we have to learn. So untap brotherhood for a purpose, look up laugh for a purpose, look up untap keg, social medias, all the DMs are open. Hit me up. Let me know. You'd like the zoom link Tuesday night at 8 PM is our next meeting for that. Um, on top of that, look for some changes coming, um, for the platform. And I think that that's it. So without further ado, my name is RJ Zimmerman. And I am very excited to be here with someone who every time I see him post on any social media, like there's artistry there, there's creativity. And honestly, like it makes you think, not just like think how you would normally. So socioeconomic digital media entrepreneur, Derek Florence II. Thank you for joining us today. How are you doing, sir? Man, um, I think I needed someone else to put it in context for me, but I'm doing pretty good. I'm glad. I'm glad. Um, you know, you're someone who is who was introduced to us through Jenny, who seems to always be putting us in touch with people who ends up uh, not just like just being on the show, but somebody that we continue to talk to for uh, and make a connection with. So. Why don't you give us a little bit of background of yourself and then we'll go from there. Hmm. Well, I'll try to do a fact sheet and let kind of the generalities be true. <laughs> um, I was born in Savannah, Georgia, raised in Fairbanks, Alaska, moved back to Savannah, Jacksonville, Florida. Uh, once I graduated <clears throat> high school uh, from Paxson School for Advanced Studies in Jacksonville, Florida, um, I went out on my own to Worcester, Ohio, to the College of Worcester, um, where it took me five years to get my bachelor's in com bachelor's of arts in computer science. Uh, played football for three out of my five years. Uh, coached f all, every year except for the first one since I was a freshman in uh, college. And then I took football overseas to get a master's in documentary filmmaking. Graduated last November uh, with distinction. Uh, off of a film I made about my sister, uh, Jessica Florence, beating uh, breast cancer for the second time. She now has stage four and has to regulate that within her life. But a survivor is a survivor. And uh, the pandemic brought me back halfway through my term. And I decided, well, since I'm home, I have money and I'm a little bit smarter now. Let's, uh, let's try the music thing out in the DMV. 
did that for a year, became really popular and brought it back home. And here we are today. Well, I want to say congratulations for the graduation Thank with you. distinction. That is, that's not something that just tiptoe past. <laughs> I, you know, everyone does that for me. So I'm, I'm glad, uh, you know, um, you talk about your music and how that has gotten popular. Mm -hmm. Have you always been um, like music being your outlet? Have you always kind of thought about things from an uh, instrumental perspective or is it something that uh, has honestly just kind of come to you uh, through the years? Um, I would say it's a mix of all three. Um, I grew up in a musical home. My dad just kind of sings whenever he wants to because uh, he used to be in a band and play a bunch of instruments. There's always instruments around the house that I get to use, electronic stuff to make instrumentals and stuff. Um, I've done chorus uh, in high school for my last two years. I was in musical theater. Um, I was in acapella in college, and I've been making my own music and uploading it to the internet for others for 13 years now. It started uh, on Reverb Nation and MySpace when I was in middle school with one of my friends, Nehemiah Nash. And, uh, MySpace was when you were in middle school. I need yeah. to touch on that for a second because yeah. that just made me feel oh, really old. <laughs> I was in middle school. Everyone was doing the top eight things. That was the first time. Well, oh, yeah. That was the first time I'll say for school, like my friends, that social media became a thing because before that, I was on the internet all the time. I've been on the internet since I was like five. Like I was in the AOL chats. I was, you know, playing checkers with people and stuff. But, um, you know, I got used to the internet and then my friends caught up and so I knew how to navigate it. They didn't. And that's when it all goes to crazy. But, um, yeah, it, it, I think that putting my music out so early while everyone was also telling me that I could freestyle in middle school helped, uh, my confidence with putting it out there and going places with it. Um, because I, I was like, yeah, first song and it's just like, me and my friend just kind of i don't know trying to do what we hear and then i go through a breakup and then i'm now like talking about it without talking about it yeah and then that's where it starts and then you find out how much you can hide within music and then you just never stop hiding information and that builds over time it's so sick so I, I found more comfort in the joy of like a, i literally put a time capsule of my life starting from like my second song I've ever made. That's, that's interesting. I'm really glad you said like how much you hide in music because, uh, you know, a lot of times when we listen to it, like there's that overt message, obviously, but then there's yeah. the deeper meaning that you can find. And, um, you know, there's so many, uh, artists right now that are, you listen to it and they've kind of taken the hidden and now they're starting to speak it right like mm -hmm. uh so obviously the big one kendrick's new album like that hits that hits hard like yeah. a lot of those songs hit hard especially if you're in a space of personal growth like that is that honestly that is a pretty courageous album to put out there oh um, yeah and yeah, I'm I'm really happy he did it. I I liked I liked the whole thing, but um, you know, when I'm listening, I listen to your album like right after um right after Jenny told me about you um and introduced you and Mons and um, you know, I the music was I don't want to say it was different. It wasn't exactly what I was expecting, but it was, yeah. I listened to the whole thing from start to finish without any breaks. Like, thank you. That was it. I really like, uh, what you did with that album. Uruku. Uruku. Yeah. Uruku. And so like that is, um, you know, I appreciate the story that you told through that. And you're also telling stories another artist that is doing this that um i was just put on to is jelly roll and mm. he does uh some like rock rap and then he started he's starting to dip his toes into uh I country music too someone with that name to do that that makes a hundred oh my god he is but if you listen to it happening yeah, yeah so he he does uh he has a song called save me 
and I want to say it's like two or three years old and it talks about saving yourself from your demons and like I love it. your addictions and mm. hating yourself and like it is it is an insanely powerful uh, song that sometimes I'll just put on when my mood, mood is low and it's mm. like it that's the thing with music is it, it, it can reflect your mood sometimes so they can dictate it a lot of the time right it can it absolutely can what you're listening to can so um when you are kind of writing your music and like doing an album um mm -hmm. what is the process as far as the theme goes is it theme first is it what you're feeling trying to get that on paper how how do you go about that because i think that's really um, interesting what it is now is just that i think a lot that's literally it i think a lot that's where all the information comes from these days uh when i was younger it was how do i make a good song and then as i got older it was how do i prove to everyone that i can rap and then when i got older it was how can i prove to everyone that i can do more than rap and then it was how can i prove i can tell a story uh, a full length story not just in a song mm -hmm. and then it was all right a concept all right production all right produce right but da, 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 your entire and then i just got more practice with becoming the song i think people have gotten lost in the fact that a good artist does not contribute wholly to every song they're on because the production may be by someone else and that might be by a slew of people or maybe someone wrote the verse for them. They're just a talented singer. So the more that we kind of strip back these artists into what they're actually contributing to their works, we get more of an understanding of who they are as a person, not just sonically. Are they good or bad? And so we're well, not good or bad, but you know, do you like what's going on? Yeah. And then with me, it's more like, yeah, I just did the song walking through the hallway. I'm about to go make it. And then it's made in like an hour or two. And that's pretty much been the process over the past. I want to say two. No, not two. Definitely longer than two. Like four years. It's been the songs in my head. I'm going to go make it now. And that's how I was able to be so consistent and put out so much music so fast, but have it artistically, uh, push my boundaries every single time okay all right that i mean that makes a lot of sense so with your music and you know you're a twitch streamer twitch.tv slash moonman flow i'll put that in the description i missed that the first time um you talk a lot about your ADHD and I yes. have ADHD and I've been very vocal about it as well. But the way that you experience it is different from how I experience it. So could, mm -hmm. could you talk a little bit about that? Because, um, I think that when people hear ADHD, they think hyperactivity, they think, mm -hmm. um, you know, focusing problems, which mm -hmm. yes to both of those sometimes like they take different manifestations, but there's a lot more that is involved like how much adhd really does it affects your entire thinking process your entire the oh, way man. your brain works so um you know could, could we talk about that for for a couple of minutes absolutely um a lot of people kind of don't understand what adhd is and that's because they have an understanding of what the people who have it describe themselves to be like but people are just now being diagnosed and so people are a bit insecure about it and the more information that they get about it they're like people get defensive about it they're like hey i have x well adhd uh as well or two and i don't like that it's a superpower and then like the person who would you know, who posted the original thing or whatever would be like, okay, we like to focus on the positives, but, and now I'm like, there's a discourse over how we talk about it. And so I explored that a little bit and it just comes down to understanding, you know, the individual letters in the acronym, it's attention deficit. Okay. We have a problem with our attention. Don't know what it is, but there's a problem with our attention. Then the H 
you either have the H or you don't. And this is where the community kind of splits at, at the H, the hyperactivity. Are we using that positively or negatively? That's, that's what's going on. Is the hyperactivity helping us or is it holding us back? That's the divide in the ADHD community and how we talk about it uh, right now is what do we do with this H part? Because the ADD people have meds and they're doing fine. So this this H thing, we, we've got everyone aware We're we're talking about it. People know what it means to them. What do we do now? And so I've just been exploring the boundaries. I last year I was like, all right, I'm going to try to watch toy, the original Toy Story in my head while running as long as the movie length is. That's just what I'm going to do. I'm going to run every single day, just like when I was a kid. And I'm going to try to remember as far as I can from start to finish at the correct time in my head. So keeping track of time as well. I am going to run the duration of Toy Story because I think I can do it. And I got about halfway through. Halfway through. And I'm like, okay, the hyperactivity just has to go towards doing something insane. However, we cannot hyperfixate on the time that we have to do that. So instead of trying to go outside and run it right now or like dedicate my entire life to doing this one thing, maybe I just run every day and then watch the movie every day and then just see, do I remember it this time? Ah, Nope. This time? Nope. And then eventually you remember it. And now you have a healthier lifestyle of thinking, watching something entertaining and focusing on it for a long duration of time. Um, remembering recall things that you should train in school uh you know rhythm timing perception of the world when it comes to your attention span and and how you can stretch it because when you exercise and you try to watch that movie don't think about the pain think about woody and buzz flying you know it, it's gonna <laughs> yeah. use it as motivation now and now you can change the chemicals in your brain while you're running due to the increase in adrenaline blah say blah now what you do can change your that h can turn your lifestyle into something more suitable to better health and not just a it helps me it hinders me i like how you brought in well we could do multiple things at once so yeah. how do we focus that into helping us right mm -hmm. one thing i've noticed with mine is i can I've always been able to do this, and uh, it turns out that this is a part of my superpower with ADHD, right? Mm -hmm. I can read three, four, five books at a time mm -hmm. and remember everything that happened in each story. Like, I can, mm -hmm. I can balance. But with that, I, like when it comes to getting into deeper meanings, I don't always grasp it. Mm -hmm. So I can remember those stories, right? I can remember it. But it might be further down the line where I'm thinking about this story that I read and I'm like, wait, that had to do with this. And then I could put two and two together. But it sometimes it's a little bit delayed. Um, you know, what, one way that I describe it is like in the, the, the easiest way. And this is for me, just me. Cleaning the house. Mm -hmm. Right. You got steps yeah. one, two, three, four. There's only four steps, right? Only four steps involved with this. I'm going to do step one because I know that's where I need to start. But then I'm going to go right to step three. And then I'm going to go to step 10 and then seven and then maybe four, or, you know, whatever. And then two, like two's going to be the last one I do. And like, that's just how I do it. So it takes me a little bit longer. And when you have people that are very organized, like that drives them bonkers. And I'm like, I can't. I, that's just how I do. Like, I don't, I don't know any different. So, yeah. um, what have you, have you found trying to take, you know, your ADHD and putting it into, uh, multiple steps like that? Is that the most effective way for you to be able to manage it? Oh yeah. And I would say computer science helped me with that. I definitely use my computer science background in everyday life and people are like, but you're not a programmer. And I'm like, exactly. I'm a scientist. Please don't forget that. So I understand how we even got to computer science and algorithms and, and, you know, efficiencies and how to do the most efficient thing, how to do the most efficient thing every single time. And if not being able to, uh, review what was the most efficient thing. So like right now, 
I have a lot of stuff in my room. However, this is the most efficient setup because the space is clear. Everything is in a corner. So when it's time to start moving stuff, I can put it out. Um, things that are important that kind of need to be away from the stuff. I e my guitar is over there. <laughs> it, now, now like you that. have a much, exactly. You have a much more cleaner kind of approach to a mess is okay. Let's reorganize. Let's rearrange the mess. Let's make a mess in little pockets and then let's clean that mess there, clean that mess there. And as we rearrange the little pockets, that's the mess of that pocket. Like if, if I'm over by, you know, the dresser, well, let's just throw all the clothes by the dresser. If it's clean, fold it, put it in. If it's not, it's, we're going to wash it and then just keep doing that. And now everything becomes a game and a problem to solve. So it, it, it's through the process of gamification that I kind of learned how to, you know, sort my way through making life easier for me i don't have to do one thing all the way to the end as fixated as possible i can do everything at one time and shorten that time by making every action more useful than just the the surface layer use of it okay the space is clear but it's also now in the space that it needs to be and i can also make a discernment as if it goes into this space or into a different one i like how you put that with the gamification because I've noticed that that works for me too sometimes. So being a you know high voltage lineman, like <laughs> what we learn is you know you do everything at the same level, you get everything done you can, and then you go down to the next level, and then you go down to the next level. So when you're first starting, you start here, go here, go here, go here. So you try to be as efficient as possible, and then you are critical of people who are not efficient, right? So then you bring that to every aspect of your life. And it's like, for someone with ADHD, mm -hmm. it doesn't work the best all the time. Uh, I mean, it's nah. it's good to have the organization and to have, like, you need that focus. But, like, one of my superpowers, um, and I love that you said that, is I thrive in chaos, right? So, like, mm -hmm. when I have to be adaptable, when I have to be flexible, that is when, like... I can my brain works the best because yeah. you have to focus and that's where like the hyper fixating but you're also able to see everything that's going on mm -hmm. and um, you know that's something that at work people didn't think that I would be able to handle like when things hit the fan and I was and it, it actually surprised a lot of people and then that's the same thing in the home life like you know, my, my kids get hurt. My kids get sick. Like, you know, that's when I step up. That's, that's when I'm really good. But I also yeah. have to understand that. And this is where it's set, that double edged sword comes in, cuts both ways. Sometimes I make that. Sometimes I make that because that's where I thrive. And I know I thrive deep down. I know that that's where I thrive. So how do I not do that? <laughs> right? How do I how do I not self sabotage just to sabotage? And uh sometimes it's a struggle. Sometimes it's a struggle. Yeah. So <clears throat> do you think that you having so many projects that you do, do you think that your ADHD helps with that? Is the cause of that? Um do you think it's something that you, and this isn't a criticism because you're good <laughs> yeah, at everything sure. you do. And I just want to put that out there. That's I not, but, it. but like, um, you know, you do have, you have a lot of projects. So do you think if you didn't have ADHD, you would have as many as you do? I would say it would depend on how dedicated I would have been to football. And... I say that because my life lessons are understood through the life lessons that I've learned through football and not just playing the game. It's lessons that I had to learn through being through these organizations to, to someone who doesn't know who I am. And then they kind of look at my background. It would make zero sense to them why I'd be wearing a Harvard football jacket right now, especially in Florida, especially with like the air conditioner off. It would make zero sense as to why like this is the the case. But 
Well, Harvard was the school that I was most looking forward to get into, not for the football, but for the academics. Uh, I graduated with a 4-2 uh, from Paxson, one of the more difficult schools to go to in the nation. Um, still football, so football was my way in. However, you know, my backup was my actual credentials in school. Um, I am in rehab recovery so that I can play football again next year. So keeping my body warm is the best thing to do right now. <laughs> it's aesthetically cool. There's a story to tell off of it. And um, now and then it starts to make sense <laughs> in a way. So like because I'm so because I love the paraphernalia of football and stuff like that, and I just wear a bunch of different teams and stuff everywhere I go. But it was because I at one point represented those teams. It made me focus on always having football as my pole in life. And I think that's all my ADHD kind of does <clears throat> kind of does is like pick a pole. Is it music? Is it football? Is it? I don't know your relationships is it your mom pick one and no matter what decision you make it pushes this forward and that's how i organize my adhd so I, if i think if i if i always had football as the pole since that's what i wanted to do was be in the nfl when i was younger and i had oh i had so much help so much help but um if that was the case, then I believe so, because that kind of attitude, ethic and creativity does trend towards other fields. It does. It does. So with those other projects, right, in your football, and I think how you explain things, um, right? And you, you were telling me about your coaching and how you bring like your computer programming into that and like um how you're able to talk about even like your adhd right there or um you know these deep concepts like you come up with metaphors that are unique that make a lot of sense and um you know you're able to convey a lot of stuff how where does that kind of uh come from you know is that like uh music uh listening to music and being able to uh relate that is that like just something you've been able to pick up along the way um, where do you think that that talent comes from i i think it comes from training my empathy and my best friend ronnie was kind of the first person to introduce me to empathy on a scale that was bigger than I accept myself for who I am and I tolerate those who are not. Um, there was a point in, in my life where tolerance was weird because the people who other people tolerated, I was actually cool with. And then that just kind of kept going. And so as I found more of these fringe people who were similar to me, um, I gained a lot more empathy for those identities and I learned how to talk with these identities and then turn, talk about like the mixture of these identities. So I got to a point where I learned that, you know, the labels that people give themselves aren't to confuse you there because this is the Lego pieces of their character. So if you understand enough about this Lego piece, you know, a little bit about someone. And so I just look at everyone as like a bunch of Lego pieces. And every time I learn something new about you, I take that generalization and I hold it in the back of my mind. You might act like this. It's up for you to surprise me. And then to solidify it, <laughs> I turned it into a color theory. So now I just understand like empathy through when I see someone, what are they wearing? What colors are it? Uh, where are we? Are we outside? Are we inside? Is this a business that is, and it's not. Now I literally can pinpoint who I think you should be. And then it's up to you to open up uh, from the back end, because I'm just going to, I'm just going to look at you aesthetically. And then I'm going to empathize with you aesthetically. And then as you open up about your personhood, I'm now going to con firm like the blocks that I thought and the blocks that don't fit whatever you tell me that's a block now 
So we got a Lego block of a person. They say, oh, I'm from Texas. All right, we got the Texas block. We know what people from Texas are, right? <laughs> You know, I'm Afro-Latino. Okay, she's Afro-Latino. We got that block. We know a bit about that history and stuff like that. And she's wearing an anime shirt. Oh, do you like anime? No, I just like the shirt. Okay, does not watch anime, but likes the aesthetic. I know people like that. I know what they kind of act like. And that's how I build people's character up when I talk to them. It's always, I learn something more about you. And it's going to be something related to your personhood, not an aesthetic. So I get a much more in-depth understanding of who people are. So when I communicate with them, I can always speak from discourse, pedagogy, or if I don't want to really say anything at all, comedy. Okay. Yeah. I mean, we've, we've talked about your color theory before and, the empathy where it comes from and that's Mm -hmm. you know it's very i don't think interesting is a strong enough word right like Mm -hmm. i mean it's how you how you brought it up i mean it is it is it it's pretty brilliant and um as you're talking to people and you're filling in these lego pieces um you know how do you try to stay kind of a uh, neutral instead of trying to steer them one way or the other? Like what's the, how do, how do you keep your confirmation bias uh, kind of in the neutral position? Um, there's a way to analyze sentences with which you can estimate the confidence level of what someone is saying. So, Along with psychological tells, you can tell when someone's lying. You can tell when someone isn't quite confident. You can tell when the kind of, like for me specifically, when my movement is a bit too big and people kind of shut off their body a little bit. And I'm like, ah, tighten up. And now let's go back to talking more calmly. Let's talk about something more serious because this is, this is posing as a threat. Some people are more emotional beings than they are logical ones. So if you get big and they respond negative, negatively to that, you now have to give space. And it's being able to gauge that comfortability um, and doing method acting, improv, and like all that stuff that now the conversation can go literally in any direction. I just have to make sure that I'm understanding your boundaries so that I don't get too big or I don't say something that now we're arguing. We may debate. If I get to the point where we debate, then I stepped on the line. I didn't cross it. And that's always fine. So that's, I think that for me uh, helps out a lot overall is like figuring out the line. And if it needs to be stepped on, step on it because that's probably a boundary for me. And we need to talk about it so that we can get this hashed out. Yeah. But other than that, you know, don't cross the line. And that's with anybody. I love that. I love that. I love everything that you just said there is, I think, valuable for everybody who uh, is watching this, especially, you know, with interactions with people, because sometimes we do it. You know, sometimes people have talent and they don't have to think about it, but sometimes we need to think about you know, what we're seeing people kind of how they're reacting to us. What did I just do? How can Mm -hmm. I, you know, back off a little bit and make them feel more comfortable because it's not just about us being comfortable. It's also about allowing other people to be comfortable as well. And, um, you know, I just, I love how you put that. So now that we know a little bit about Derek, I would just like to know, you know, because I saw your tweet about this and I, I really want people to know this. Yeah. How has sobriety helped you with your creativity? Oh, man, it has allowed me to un- it allowed me at a very early age to separate the art from the artist. Um, There was at one point where my music was really just questions I had not questions it was a conversation i had with myself and it was how much do i love myself because i was at a point where i had accepted so much abuse in my life that in my mind it was wild to me that i was the happiest person i knew 
So I was like, is, is this narcissism? And so I just made a, a, a project where it's like, uh, it was called high chair. And I explored the concept of like, what if I spoke about relationships in every song, but I'm actually just talking to myself. And then after I like make it, let it breathe and come back to it and think about myself, do, do these still resonate? Do I still think I'm stupid sometimes? Do I still, am I still Clyde from Bonnie and Clyde? Um, because I'm the type of person who's like, oh, we're going to do a fun thing. All right, sick. And now there's just loyalty to the fun thing. Um, that's also gotten me in some situations where, you know, it could have gotten, be- it could have gone better. However, it's life. You take risks. Mm-hmm. And so it's like, yeah, I feel pretty Clyde. Like I take risks all the time. I literally can't stop. Um, and that, that project for me started the, the kind of process of introspective music. Um, and going from that point forward, it just kind of evolved every single time. Like I said, new questions for every different project. So, um, sobriety helped me understand the bigger moments in my life that were weird. The very liminal spaces, like being in a car with someone driving way too fast or being at a party and everyone but you is drunk and high. People are falling and having fun with the people, self-destructing, like going back and being able to assess all those situations like could i have done something to prevent like that type of fun nope couldn't have i'm i'm right i'm standing over here and doing what i'm doing is the most efficient thing that i can do i could go over and be mr hero blah say blah but it wouldn't fix the problem he'll be back and doing it next week yeah so his friends should help him with that and then these are the types of things that are going on in my head. And then I bounce these conversations off with a lot of women because, you know, you get the other perspective and then one, two, skip a few. You're very empathetic from someone who is very narcissistic in, you know, maybe a vulnerable and positive way. You're now an empath and it being a narc, being able to turn on narcissism and being able to turn on empathy. That's its own sort of, superpower and respect but it came through communication and conversation through being sober throughout all of these larger more like this is the agora type of thoughts you know the public domain where all where we accept everything for what it is and everyone is who they are those what those are what like college parties convention parties uh music festivals and stuff like that that's what those are if if you're okay with everyone in the crowd, you really don't care who, where the person next to you is from, what they do. Y'all just like the same song. So let's see how we all act when we all have the freedom. Okay. Now I know everyone from every week, every party, every, I, I just understand who you all are. And it's like, okay, you're the guy who blacks out all the time. What's your day to day like? Because we can't have this. Well, you see, oh, you weren't talking to me. I'm sorry. Yeah, see? <laughs> <laughs> exactly. You know, it's like we, we got to be more personable sometimes. And that comes with sobriety and being open with people. That being open with people, that's the hard part. Yeah. The sobriety that's not necessarily it is don't get me wrong it is yeah it's difficult it's that next that next step to being open with people that is i think that that's why and i've been doing a lot of thinking about this this week um a lot of sober and recovery people we gravitate towards one another because it's easy to be open to someone who is also open and also Mm -hmm. Like, you're not going to use my worst against me because you also told me your worst, right? Like, we understand the glass houses that we live in. Mm -hmm. And so we just put the stones down. And that's, that is why, that's what I have found in the past, you know, honestly, only the past year really Mm -hmm. is like the community of people who 
understand the glass house that we all live in and have put the stones down and like that's who i really connect with and i think that that's why you you and i we have pretty good conversations you know because Mm -hmm. a i like learning from people who are smart and you know that's something that um you get from you pretty quick is that you are a smart person and there's a lot that can be learned there and then different perspectives too i searched that out um one thing that we haven't talked about that i really want to talk about with along sobriety lines is you were one of the people that received uh not drinking tonight from untapped kegs 100th episode yes it is a book that has still stuck with me and the people who uh, have read it on my recommendation like they they love it i would like to hear your feedback from that book um because i know that you finished it mm. uh without really going super in depth mm-hmm. um i f- i think it's a good first step for a lot of people who want to attempt uh sobriety to the extent of you know uh uh, clearing clearing your mental well-being um a a lot of very personable things and and that's you know what that book kind of feels like is a therapy session or a group session i agree and yeah and and so like i leave it around for people to kind of look at like in the house it's like oh here it is like i remember one day i put it next to like I don't know, an empty wine glass on the table. <laughs> and it's like, yeah, I just leave it around the house. Cause like, I mean, my, my people aren't alcoholics or anything, but it's kind of like a being able to decide, you know, you want, you know, drinking tonight, maybe not tomorrow. I shouldn't even be thinking about tomorrow. We'll see when I get there, you know, stuff, stuff like that. Um, being able to just kind of make, make a, make the healthier now choice and forget about the later choice. So that that's what I'll say is, is kind of the biggest thing for, for me, what that felt like. So, yeah. I, I really like that. You said, um, the, it felt like a therapy session because as much as that book is about like alcohol and its effects on you, like Mm -hmm. for me, my biggest takeaway was it was beginner's guide to emotions. Right. Mm -hmm. And then it was also beginner's guide to therapy and, a good relationship with a therapist and what that looks like because we talk about therapy we talk about emotions and you know jenny does a really good job with feeling words and really starting to answering the question honestly how are you doing today how are you feeling um but like when we talk about therapy nobody says what it not even really what it should look like because it's never going to look the same for you, but what a good relationship with your therapist looks like. And I think that that is so, um, indispensable, especially when you start to get into it because you don't know what you don't know. And when you're stepping into therapy, a lot of times you're stepping into the unknown. So you will think, that no matter what it feels good but that's not rarely honestly is the first time going to be like your therapist that you should stick yeah. with so um when it comes to you know your sobriety and how you're able to analyze you know situations um How does that help you with filmmaking? Because you, you know, we haven't gotten into that yet. So, you know, you make short films um, Mm -hmm. and then you made a TV series that's on uh, YouTube. Let's talk about that a little bit. Sweet. So I am a bunch of different things for this series called uh brotherland b-r-o-t-h-a-l-a-n-d question mark and uh i'm just gonna go off of how it was explained to me when i first got brought on the project back in uh september um a friend of a friend mentioned me and they needed somebody to play this one character and i was just the character it's like yeah this is you how do you like this show? You want to be a part of it? And I was like, yeah, sick. Like, what's it about? And then, you know, Cardo Wanzer, the creator, uh, he told me, 
you know, the idea just kind of came from, you know, if people would color were colors, how would they interact with each other? Um, and, you know, outside of just regular color theory of like this color means this, this color means that. And then the triads of colors, complementary, you know, whatever you want to get into about how to apply color theory. Sure. But when we get into the emotional side of colors or maybe the historical side of colors, and then we place them through the lens of men in uh, the DMV area, how do those now we can have a conversation of look at what they're wearing, look at the scenery around them. That's the environment. Notice how their clothes change. Notice how they approach these situations and how who they are as a color and a character come out. And I was like, sick, high five, let's do it. And then I became a bunch of different things for that. It started as like uh, Karama, the, um, the music guy. Uh, his color is orange and Karama is from Naruto, the nine-tailed fox. Um, and there's a lot, there's a big anime theme into it as well. And I just come on as the quiet guy who's like, he doesn't say much. Like they met at a dance class. He's pretty smooth. And he's got, you know, the, one of the protagonist's uh, uh, siblings is his partner. Just like, oh, sick. Like, let's go. Um, and yeah, I felt like that was me as a person that year because of Owureku. So I just took the personality of what I was going through in real life with Owureku, put that into a character, Karama, because they said I, I was just the person, so I should just be myself. And then I just kept exploring. Now I explored what Owureku uh, looks like when he has his kite, his partner. And that's where the kite EP comes from. That's where the album drops at the end of the year. And that's how we go into a movie we're shooting at BlurredCon this year. And I performed at BlurredCon last year. I was really big into the music thing. And then it's like my worlds keep colliding, but in the best way possible. So um, I have a much more open kind of expression of self in this version of what we have going on because it's separate from kind of season two separate but leads into it and we learn more about me since i didn't show up much and i was pretty quiet and we learned that i'm just, i'm just boy it looks like mania but it's actually you know my control of adhd and my empathy and it comes off as a borderline personality disorder which i show symptoms of as well so it's like, a, okay, let me use, you know, film to keep exploring these feelings and ideas because it's working because we get to build characters off of this. So I got to explore uh, borderline personality disorder through my character. And I'm, you know, getting closer, closer to assure myself that, okay, it probably wasn't BPD. It could be. However, you were just going through mania still. So it allows me to like acting, looking back at what we shot, what we did, and looking back at past versions of myself through my films, especially Changes, because Changes was when I came back from the pandemic and I made that in three days. And I was just like, all right, this is how I feel about the future. So two years later, it's winning awards and stuff. I get from Mumbai, India, uh, best filmmaker of the future. I'm like, okay, sick. So I am onto something at least two years in advance. So whatever I can kind of claim about myself, or like set myself up for my maximum window of understanding of how the world moves is two years forward. I'll always remember what life was like moving forward um, from when I was born moving up because of the recollections and how strong my memory is. I have a good understanding of where I am in space and time now, and I can predict up to two years into the future. And then that becomes like my reality. So instead of having to kind of look at um you know it's taking therapy to a whole nother level and a whole nother whole nother place of thought um it's allowed self-directed therapy i've been in for four or five years uh where i get the information and just apply it instead of talking to someone about very personal things mm -hmm. um you know, that is now happening at a rapid pace to where I just look for information that I don't have yet, which is typically going to be the second to second what's changing in the world. And then just keep my, my two year prediction updated for every second. New information. All right. That changes the prediction two years down the line, two years down the line. And as long as everything just kind of does this. Doesn't matter what kind of happens if I plan for it, but like as long as everything makes sense as to why it's happening, 
then I at least have two years of understanding where I will be. Should I keep up with this rate of change? Hmm. So <clears throat> congratulations on all the awards. Um, I see you put those out. Um, you know, it seems like they're coming out at a pretty quick clip now. If people wanted yeah. to watch changes, where where would they be able to see that? Is it available anywhere? It is on YouTube, and you're going to you can well I'll take that back. It's on YouTube, yes, under my uh, YouTube page, Moon Man Flow, M O O N M A N F L O. One word, and please do not let autocorrect split Moon Man and Flow. Don't don't let it do that. The app will be like, yeah, that guy doesn't exist. You'll get none of his videos. <laughs> yeah, no. Make sure that's all one thing. I, I always have to tell people that, like, put it put it all one thing before you search anything, and then changes, and it'll come up. Or you can look it up on IMDb. Um, yeah, it, all the links should be on IMDb as well under Derek Florence II. So uh, if you wanted to check it out there, there's also a water cut because water is the mental health album I made uh, the following year. Um, and I just cut in the music videos and some clips of some short films that I have coming up that I just haven't had the time to work on uh, and put them in very important spots within uh changes because they all come from the same world. Post pandemic, what do we do? People are leaving us for multiple reasons what do we do for ourselves and so changes is kind of what what does me as a person who Derek Florence does through the lens of this guy Anthony but the the music videos are like all right what does this person do what is this person who is this guy why is he wearing that why is he in every why is he a ghost questions but it's a world it, it, it's a world because you don't know who next to you has schizophrenia you don't know who's next to you and is hallucinating right now you don't know who's making a music video versus who's making a tiktok versus who's making it's all different and we just have to kind of accept it and move forward hmm. i like how you put that where you don't know what anybody's going through so you have to kind of accept that as the reality yeah. because it is the reality and then move forward so Changes is about what you do for yourself now. Mm -hmm. So it's about self-love. Right. You were ahead, right? Man, like, so far. Geez. So far. That is that is awesome. That is that is awesome. So I didn't know that that's what Changes was about. I yeah. haven't watched it yet. Um, I plan on checking it out. Hopefully I can get some time this week. Um you know, oh, this is where it was shot. So, you know, <laughs> this is where a lot of things are shot. The dub right now, music video. This is where a good 80% of my discography was made. Like this is, this is the studio. This is it. <laughs> awesome. So as we're winding down, how, you know, what would you like to leave people with, um, from Derek? What, would, what is it that you want people to take away? Um, stop being so inspired uh is the main one be motivated absolutely be motivated but stop being so inspired we're at the point now where everyone feels very polarized in their opinions which means you're not going to persuade people you have to let people you have to let guilt grow and that comes with being right when you become on the right side of the line of history you get to hold that in pride and just keep walking knowing that you were on the right side of history the people on the wrong side guilt and they got to deal with that. So don't be so inspired by, you know, a sad guru, uh, uh, a Gary V, uh, your favorite music artist. Don't be so inspired uh, personally, artistically. Sure, 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 sure. But if we're talking about who they are as people, don't idolize Zendaya. Don't do things like that because you're going to fall in love with them personally. And you're going to start to, in a sense, worship them. It's very weird. But the more that you invest the time in understanding who a person is and you don't disagree with those person's actions and you like what they do, you're forming what's what's called. Um, uh, what is it? Uh, it's a form of relationship that uh, usually stems between artist or creator and fan. Um, time about like stalker I, or you know, put them on a pedestal. It's, 
I, I use this term all the time. Uh, it'll come to me. But essentially what it is is you get a fan. You get a follower. That's, that's all you could ever be because this person has not made the connection with you. So the more of their personhood and life that is out right now, and boy, is everyone's stuff out right now, we get a better idea of who these people are, and we like them as people. And we're like, I want to be more like this person. Be careful because how did they get there? So that would be my piece of advice is just inspire yourself or go out in nature. Uh, get inspired from reading science stuff. Like find inspiration in the, in the nature of the world because finding it in people right now is the most nuclear thing that you could do right now as the world is changing so um find some sense of self really like make a list of uh, uh uh atomically what you believe and understand and what you what you love to your core what will never not be a what's the biggest lego blocks of your personhood figure out what those are stack them up and you know those topple those put, you can burn it they're still going to stick together the bigger they are because that's how mechanically they function. So find your biggest Lego pieces. I'm not gonna say as quickly as possible, as healthfully as you can. Stick them all together and never change from those core pieces. Add and remove any small piece that you want. But those, I wanna say pick five. Those five, never betray those five. And then you become the sixth once you built yourself completely together. And six is a very core number of stability after five. Five is security, six is stability. I love that. So Nitz, uh, Nitz by Ice says parasocial is there. The it word is. We're I knew for. she would knew parasocial relationships because I use it in reference to a community that we're both a part of a lot of the time, and it's where like, yeah, you establish a consistent fan base. These people still don't know you. Let's mm -hmm. not treat them as if they're we're best friends, and that happens a lot. And I can only be frustrated by it because it's not a community that I that is based around me. But, you know, I'm a big part of it. So me seeing it, it's my job to bring it up. How we go forward from there, that can change. I'm not saying this is the way it's always going to be, but it can mm -hmm. change. I'm just letting people know, hey, this is what's happening. Be wary of it because parasocial relationships are very, very, whew. we're still trying to figure out how to make that bridge, um, how to burn that bridge, honestly. Artists are doing it. Um, thought leaders are doing it. We're burning the bridge of parasocial relationships because just because you follow me does not mean you know me or have access to me in any regards that we have not already established. So it's another boundary that people who want to be famous should uh, you know, start to build up as they build their careers and not wait to get famous. And now they have to have detail, security, uh, form the turtle and a sheet curtain running around everywhere because you want to be out in public. I literally got away with just wearing whatever I wanted in the DMV for a year and no one knew who I was good because I'm still successful behind the scenes. I like that. So, um, <clears throat> Scotty Mays in the chat says, uh, we rob ourselves of our true self by living through the image of others. And I love that. I love that. And beautiful. That's, that's a really succinct way of putting it. Cause I've talked before about putting people on pedestals and that includes honestly parents, like everybody is a person and parents all they seem larger than life you know mm -hmm. and as a person that pedestal will fall and it's just a matter of how how high is it going to be when it falls and um you know that can be really damaging to you as a person so try not to build you know put people on pedestals that they'll never be able to live up to because people are fallible it doesn't matter yeah. who you are and yeah. i really i love that message that you said because finding the inspiration in you know through yourself like you could take things from other people uh right but you can't mm -hmm. just take them and put them into your life verbatim you have to figure out how it can and if it's feasible to try it right mm -hmm. and that's that's something that i think we lose sight of sometimes is that uh you know we're all unique 
So things that work somewhere are not going to work perfectly for us in another place. So keep, keeping that in mind is very important. So Derek, if people want to keep up with you, where can they find you? Um, primarily stick to Instagram. I would say at Moonman Flow, uh, and then uh, at Nineties TV to check out the whole production house and record label of folks, including our lovely MVP and PR uh, of twenty twenty one, Nits by Ice. Uh, she really. <laughs> Oh my God, she just has our music playing all over Twitch, and I I can't say um, how much I appreciate her for that, especially being a graduate of my, our uh, rival high school. So, you know, it, it, it's all love at the end in competition. So, you know, we're we're both in our lives now, and and she has been a, a great piece of what we've got uh, going on. And you can support her on Twitch as well, everyone. Uh, but yeah, Moon Man Flow on Instagram. If you want to see more of my day to day kind of what I got going on, see me coach kids and get important updates about like shows going on in the future and stuff like that. Twitter, if you just want to see me be cynical, yeah, go there. Cynical in like a very fun way. Uh, <laughs> go to Twitter and you, you might get some some drops of stuff that don't make it to Instagram quite yet. So Twitter is the if you want to be early to stuff, come to Twitter. Instagram is the keep up with me. YouTube is the archive. And then, you know, the music's everywhere. So, uh, yeah, uh, that's how you that's how you're going to keep up with me. And I'm I'm keeping up with everybody. So I'm putting the onus on you guys. <laughs> if you want to know what's going on with me, you just got to look at my page and stay there long enough to see what goes on. So I appreciate that. Um, you know, thank you for being here. This was I, I enjoyed this conversation. I enjoy any time that we talk. So um, you can find us at Untapped Keg everywhere on social media. DMs are open. If you need some help, if you want to talk, if you want to celebrate, you know what? Hit us up. Uh, we'll help you find resources. We'll be there for a couple years. Um, you know, that's no matter what, like we will try to connect you with people that might be um, better suited for the conversation, but we care, right? And that's what I want people to know is like, I do care and I will help you as much as I can. And then, uh, you know, untap keg on all podcast services, hit that subscribe button, leave us a five star review on iTunes, on Spotify, on good pods. I highly recommend good pods. If you're looking for a platform to, sh you know, to listen to podcasts from it's new up and coming. Uh, it's easier to find smaller podcasts on good pods. They will kind of take what you are listening to and it's more it's not quite an algorithm it has a more of a human uh component to it so it's not just stuff that uh you know like the same subject that you've been listening to so hit up good pods look up on tap keg help us get to that number one spot in the mental health uh podcast field and then <clears throat> head to youtube youtube.com slash untap keg you could be part of the show you could uh get your question asked on the live recording of the podcast and like i said at the beginning you know look look for some changes that are coming up but appreciate everybody who's been here appreciate you derek go check out derek's work uh, because it is it is really really good and i'm not just saying that because he's, he's on i thought that before i asked him to be on so um, have a good week, everybody. I love you. Appreciate it. And let's have a, let's try to be better tomorrow than we were today. Cause at least if we don't make it, we tried. 